Um, our next presentation is titled Conservation Action Planning, Spurring New Habitat Restoration and Community Engagement Across the Calumet Region. Um, we have a number of speakers from a number of different organizations um, who will introduce themselves, but everyone please welcome um, Paul, Commissioner Dubuque, Dean, Jennifer, Brad, Craig, Matt, Chip, Gary, Lauren, and Refugio. Um, and I, now I will pass it off to Brad, who will be the moderator for this session. Um, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Kasberg. I'm the Wetland Restoration Manager for Audubon Great Lakes. And I will be uh, um, moderating the, the Q&A throughout the session. Um, and I am excited to hand it off to Commissioner Kim Dubuclay from, from uh, MWRD, who uh, has graciously um, um, and willing to uh, moderate the event and introduce our uh, upcoming speakers. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Brad. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Dubuclay, and I'm a commissioner with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. I will be your host for the next 90 minutes as we learn a lot of exciting things about the new restoration work across the Calumet region of Illinois and Indiana. We're going to hear from and about a whole array of organizations and agencies that are partnering in this work. I'm just gonna give you just a quick 30 second bit about me. I'm actually from the far south side Calumet region. So I'm very familiar with that area and all the potential that it has. Um, and then a bit about MWRD. Um, through collaborations with various groups over the past two decades, MWRD recognizes that there are tremendous opportunities to work with the community and other stakeholders in, re in restoration and the revitaliz revitalization of the Calumet region. MWRD recognizes the importance of wet wetlands and restored natural ecosystems as a critical component of a functioning ecosystem. Ecosystem function contributes to higher water quality, better flood control, healthier environments, and valuable wildlife habitat. Accomplishing restoration of wetlands and other wildlife, wild, wildlife habitats, that's a tongue twister, um, requires the hard work and dedication of many partners in the Calumet region, including park districts, municipalities, non-government organizations such as the Audubon Society and the community at large. Using strong science and creativity, these degraded environments can be restored to highly functioning ecosystems. I'm sure many of you have read the recent Chicago Sun-Times article on our work in the Calumet Industrial Corridor, which highlighted the work we are doing there with exceptional quality biosolids and compost. Biosolids, as you all know, um, can be added to and incorporated into topsoil to improve soil health and lead to improved establishment of native ecosystems and wildlife habitats. Um, so the MWRD has done quite a few collaborations with the Calumet region, and I'm just gonna touch on a couple, and then we will move on with the program. We partner with the Chicago Park District, uh, where both of our boards have collaborated to approve um, a 37 year lease agreement for the Dead Stick Pond Project. Uh, we intend to work with other organizations such as Audubon Society to use propriety to use property as native habitat and managed wetlands. And um, we've been cooperating again with the Chicago Park District to develop open spaces for natural habitat and recreational uses uh, for, dead stick, for dead stick pond. So that's just a very general highlight of some of the work that MWRD has done in collaboration with community and other organizations. So enough about me. It's time to get on to this wonderful, fabulous program that we're about to, to see in here. Um, so I am going to say um, lots of effort, uh, lots of effort behind the scenes goes into this kind of work and it takes time to get results. But what you're going to see in here about today is the fun stuff. The impacts this kind of work has on the people and wildlife who visit or call Calumet home, including secretive marsh birds. So with that, please type any questions that you have into the chat box. We'll be watching and collecting those for Q&A portions at the end. Um, so to start, I think we're gonna hear from Paul, ba Paul Botts of the Wetlands Initiative. He has prepared something about the Calumet region and its challenging but exciting wetlands. 
So please, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner David Clay. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about a unique part of our Chicago wilderness region, an area where enormous restoration opportunities and challenges are two sides of the same coin. The Calumet region stretches from the Michigan City area around Lake Michigan to Lake Calumet and the mouth of the Calumet River on Chicago's far south side. For thousands of years, that area included huge wetlands complexes. Then, for more than a century, it was a beating heart of the industrial age. Steel mills and rail yards and oil refineries and company towns mixed uncomfortably with pieces of globally unique biodiversity. In the second half of the 20th century, new plans and ideas for the Calumet region were still mostly about things like international airports, big new shipping harbors, or building a World's Fair site. Starting in the 1980s, though, the ecological restoration potential of this area got more attention. During the 90s, some conservation visions and big plans were made. Since then, a lot of organizations and volunteers have been restoring beautiful pieces of prairie and oak savanna and sand savanna and dune and swale on both sides of the state line. If you haven't yet visited those lovely places, I highly recommend it. Some of the largest potential restoration sites in the Calumet, though, were still sitting on the drawing board. That's both because they're big and because they are wetlands. Wetlands restoration has a special challenge, water. You're gonna to have to control the flow of water or change it or adjust to it, or probably all of the above. Water can have big impacts, not just on the ecology and beauty that you're restoring, but on all the people living or working or traveling nearby. And of course, it's also affected by them. So wetlands restoration in the developed world can be particularly tricky you're gonna to need to bring both ecological and engineering expertise to bear. All of that applies times 10 in the Calumet region. There aren't too many places in the world really where the local hydrology was altered more intensively and rapidly than in the Calumet. Lots of the original wetlands were drained or ditched or filled in. Literally no section of any local river or lake or pond or creek in there looks a lot like it did just a few human generations ago. There are some brownfields challenges. And that whole region is now crisscrossed with big railroads and highways and culverts and bridges and power lines that aren't going anywhere. This afternoon, you'll hear about how some organizations and agencies are collaborating on exciting new wetlands restoration at several key Calumet sites. These projects are at different stages. Some are well along, some are just getting going. One thing they do have in common, though, is a concept called conservation action planning. We knew as of say five or 10 years ago that what was needed in the Calumet wasn't a fresh round of strategic plans or visions. Everyone involved in the area pretty much knew where the big restoration opportunities were. You might say we all had mostly the same top 10 list. And based on years of bird monitoring by some dedicated volunteers with some increasingly alarming results, we also had a poster child for urgency regarding these wetlands declines in several species of what my Audubon friends call secretive marsh birds. And you're gonna hear more about those. Still, a couple of things were needed before we could jump into the mud at these places. One was to put down on paper the basic how of each site so that decision makers, such as the public agencies, which mostly own these sites, could have a sense of what they're signing up for. And since conservation nowadays is a collaborative enterprise, we also needed a process to bring partners and communities together to agree on restoration goals and steps. Audubon Great Lakes and the Wetlands Initiative together instigated conservation action plans for a number of Calumet wetland sites. In other cases, groups of partners came together figure out how best to tackle a particularly complicated restoration. Okay, now it's time for the fun stuff. Let's start with an important concept that is common to all of these Calumet wetland restorations. It's called hemi-marsh. And my last task here is to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gary Sullivan, who's going to show you what hemi-marsh is and why it's important. So, what is hemi-marsh? Hemi marsh can loosely be defined as a 50-50 mosaic on emergent vegetation and open water. 
It is highly interspersed with a high edge to volume ratio. And it is that extensive edge habitat that is so beneficial to wildlife. Hemi marsh forms a structural mosaic of emergent plants that extends from the more densely vegetated shallows up to the depth limit of emerging cover. Hemi marsh can only develop we find a dynamic relationship among plants, animals, and hydrology. All three of these elements interact together, simulating both positive and negative feedbacks. It is a three-dimensional space where you can find, for example, soras foraging in the lower canopy, yellow-headed blackbirds nesting in the upper canopy, and gallinules raising a family at the water surface. The open water may also be vegetated with submerged species that provide food and shelter to fish, insects, and other animals, including nesting habitat to pie-billed reeds. And here is the real star of the show, the amazing muskrat, the engineer who makes all this happen. Muskrats build their communities by hollowing out the emergent vegetation to create a structural anastomosis that supports all of this wildlife. A habitat that can look something like this in the Hemi Marsh that you see here. Thank you, Gary. So keep Hemi Marsh in mind as you're learning about these wetlands restoration projects. Now, Commissioner Dubuclet, back to you. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Gary. That was extremely um, informative. It's always so interesting to hear about the secret of marsh birds as well as Hemi Marsh. So speaking of Hemi Marsh, I'm gonna introduce our next two speakers. Um, the next speaker would be Lauren Umek, who is a former colleague of mine from the Chicago Park District. And I'm always excited to hear what she has to say. And Gary Sullivan of the Wetlands Initiatives. They're gonna continue the discussion on Hemi Marsh restoration and community engagement at Big Marsh and Indian Ridge Marsh on Chicago's far south side. So Gary and, Gary and Lauren, please take it away. This group includes representatives from a number of key organizations in the region, all of whom recognize the importance of the Calumet region for global conservation, but also for engaging people with nature that is close to home. With large expanses of natural areas that have a unique mosaic of different freshwater coastal and upland ecosystems, as well as unique historical and cultural land uses, this region offers opportunities unlike anywhere else to engage people in the city and beyond with being outdoors for their physical and mental health, and ideally a better understanding and appreciation of the incredible natural world that exists very close to home. So to start us off, Gary Sullivan and I will discuss exactly that combination of ecology and community by talking about Hemi Marsh restoration and community engagement at Big Marsh and Indian Ridge Marsh. Over the past 10 years, there has been really great progress made in restoring marsh habitat at Big Marsh and Indian Ridge Marsh, like the Sunway Marsh developing at Indian Ridge. This is true restoration in the sense that both of these sites were once part of a vast marsh system surrounding Lake Calumet. You can see many of these wetlands were still intact in this 1939 aerial image with some of Indian Ridge already being filled in. Today, most of these wetlands have been lost, along with most of Lake Calumet. What's left of Big Marsh and the Indian Ridge Marsh are two of the largest remnants that remain. Before restoration efforts even began, much of the shore that once teemed with life looked like this, sterile, muddy water surrounded by a forest of the invasive common reed, Phragmites. As you can see in this aerial at the north end of Indian Ridge Marsh, Phragmites forms a dense monoculture that suppresses all other species from the upland out to about a foot of water or more. A great deal of the marsh at both sites has been filled in with material that supports little or no native vegetation, such as slag, concrete, bricks, and other types of construction debris, and other material that has not been identified, but remains problematic in that it doesn't support plant life. Open access has encouraged some of the public to dump their trash, old appliances, and even their cars, which for some reason they love to burn. I 
can't begin to tell you about the hundreds, if not thousands, of tires that we've pulled from the wetlands, and many more still remain. Leaching chemicals from both on-site and off-site have left some of the water polluted and uninviting to people and wildlife. It is this history that is both our challenge and our opportunity. To turn around this legacy of abuse, the Chicago Park District has worked with partners that are committed to restoring wetlands for both wildlife and people. Their goal has been to restore a functional hydrology, control or eliminate invasive species, and then clean up, remove, or cap noxious materials, control limited access to stop fly dumping from the public, and to remove construction debris and other waste materials. Finally, to plant and develop native plant communities and actively manage these sites into the future. One way to restore hydrology is through the installation of water control structures, such as the one installed here at Big Marsh around 2013, which allowed water levels to be manipulated in order to stimulate a naturally dynamic system. This is the outline of the permanently high open water zone back in 2015. And this is the open water zone in 2018, after water levels were lowered to stimulate plant growth. Notice that the exposed shoreline, now outside the outline, is covered in marsh vegetation. After a short period of time, areas that had been flooded and unvegetated for over 50 years began to look like this. By superimposing the two outlines, we can see a net increase of nearly 50 acres of marsh vegetation, much of which developed into hemi marsh. And here is a much more primitive water control structure at Indian Ridge Marsh, which has since been modified in order to draw water levels down north of 122nd Street. And these are the sediments exposed after the initial drawdown, which was unfortunately short-lived due to the high waters of Lake Michigan flooding the site over the past few years. But despite such setbacks, we've dealt successfully with Fragmites through both the ground and aerial application of herbicides. Prescribed burning to strategically remove thatch and open up the site to management. Cap the dumping zones and restore natural topography. And to introduce a wide diversity of native plant species with Park District staff, partners, and volunteers. And we're already beginning to see the fruits of these efforts. This 2020 image at the North Shore of Indian Ridge Marsh illustrates the restoration and progress, a developing marsh system that is already attracting the wildlife that once thrived in these wetlands. And from a landowner and planning perspective, how do we decide how to balance conservation and recreation and community engagement goals. So I'll use Big Marsh as a primary example here, but really this process and line of thinking can apply to nearly any site within the region. So first we start by evaluating areas with the highest ecological potential. And of course at Big Marsh, as Gary pointed out, that's the Hemi Marsh. And while its initial condition was completely dominated by invasive species, we have some confidence that we have the tools to restore the marsh from its initial degraded state to one that supports a diversity of flora and fauna like we see in this image after we install the water control structure. The high habitat potential of the Hemi Marsh, of course, is counter to other areas of the region that have been impacted by human activities, including industry and fly dumping. They might have low ecological value or other environmental concerns requiring a cap or a layer of material between the existing surface and where people are invited to be. Those areas have low habitat and ecological potential, but can serve as really great opportunities for recreation, as you can see from this image of bike jumps built several feet on top of slag. Not all slag is the same. While some areas resemble a barren Martian landscape, some slag covered areas harbor some uncommon plants like the native orchids and foxgloves in this photo, and can provide unique spaces that really capture this combination of human impact on the landscape, as well as the habitat potential of the region, despite that impact. Community engagement is a term we use a lot that combines two words that ha probably have slightly different definitions for each person that uses it or hears it. For any given site, what is the community? 
For parks, it's typically the immediate neighborhood, but many of our Calumet sites, the nearest neighborhood might be a mile or more away. So the geographic definition of community might differ in some of these sites than in other places. Or is the community the birding or conservation community? Are we talking about running and biking community that may include neighbors, but may also include international travelers seeking unique recreational experiences? Perhaps the community is summer campers or kids on field trips. Um, maybe the community we're engaging includes people working nearby looking for a good lunch break spot or a place to decompress at the end of the workday. The how of community engagement, of course, depends a lot on the who, but I'll generally review some of the methods of community engagement in the region as I see them through recreation events, employment and stewardship opportunities, community science and nature's program, and generally just existing as safe and welcoming open spaces for people to engage on their own terms. Foot and bike races are, of course, excellent ways to introduce visitors from near and far to the great spaces of the Calumet region. And probably the most overlooked method of community engagement is through employment. All of the natural areas we talk about today don't exist and flourish without careful planning and maintenance. Maintenance of the landscape, of the trails, through telling stories of the region, through art and conversation. It's certainly easier to be an advocate for local conservation when conservation and maintenance of those spaces helps pay the bills. And probably our most typically discussed method of community engagement is through stewardship opportunities. It's pictured here on the left is one of our first work days featuring some of our local environmental heroes from the Southeast side, the late Bryant Williams and Peggy Salazar from Southeast Environmental Task Force, cutting buckthorn to wake, make way for new vegetation. Inviting people to contribute to the betterment of their local nature is just one way to understand and experience that landscape in a new way. There's also the opportunity for kids, adults, and families to observe the flora and fauna that call this region home, either alone or with local experts at an event. And those activities can spark a new appreciation and understanding of local nature in a profound way. We can also allow visitors to more passively participate in marsh management by simply texting the water level at various gauges throughout a lot of our natural areas. And that can provide far more detailed data collection than most agency staff have the capacity to provide on their own. And more generally, it's key to recognize that everyone has different preferred ways of engaging with nature and within their community. One fundamental way to engage people within the city and beyond is to provide a safe, welcoming open space where people can explore and interact with nature on their own terms. We can't discount the value of this, particularly when we're in a community where there's a lot of effort fighting against things that might cause harm to a community. It's critical for there to exist things that bring something positive to city life that does not require a fight. And in conclusion, a shameless plug for the future Ford Calumet Environmental Center that will be opening at Big Marsh soon. It has exhibit space, classrooms, and most excitingly for some of us, bathrooms, water fountains um, to make all these restoration and engagement efforts just a little bit easier. Thank you so much, Lauren and Greg. Um, as I said earlier, I grew up on the Southeast side, so I used to pass that area pretty much two or three times a week. So it's really awesome to see the restoration that's occurring there. And I commend you and all the people working on it for the work that you all have done. Um, so we will move on to our next presentation. Um, oh, and before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone that if you have any questions or comments, please put into the chat so that we can discuss your questions and your comments at the end. So the next person I'm going to introduce is Chip O'Leary of the Forest Preserve of District of Cook County. Chip is going to describe the restoration efforts at the Powderhorn Marsh and Eggers Grove. So Chip, take it away. Hello, I'm Chip O'Leary, Deputy Director of the Resource Management Department for the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Our department manages the natural lands in our countywide holdings. The Forest Preserves owns and manages 4,600 acres of natural lands in the Calumet region. Many of these properties are remnant prairies and dune and swale which is a mix of upland sand dunes and low emergent wetlands. These preserves qualify as some of Chicago wilderness region's most biodiverse locations. 
One of the challenges for our conservation and management is the fractured nature of our properties. In this highly developed landscape, physical connections between remnant properties is many times impossible. So we have to look at our lands and those of other conservation groups as part of an archipelago or group of islands in a sea of development. How can we effectively manage each island and how can the islands work together as a whole? Enter the Calumet Compact Alliance, a group of landowners and committed partners who are looking at the Calumet region as a single place. Forest Preserves works with the Chicago Park District, Illinois DNR, the Nature Conservancy, Audubon Great Lakes, the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission, and others to share knowledge about our properties, how we manage them, and to find common goals. Our initial lens has been looking at our properties as habitat for wide-ranging bird species. A plan for management of our wetlands for marsh birds assembled by Audubon Great Lakes and the Wetlands Initiative has helped transform our Eggers Marsh and Powderhorn Marsh properties and put a sharper focus on our Burn and Prairie Preserve. This work complements similar work done on Chicago Park District lands and the DNR's Wolf Lake. Combined, our three forest preserve property projects have restored 315 acres of marsh bird habitat at these key properties. Birds flying north along Lake Michigan shoreline can now find habitat options again in places they once inhabited. Let's take a closer look at the completed work at Eggers Marsh and the proposed work at Powderhorn Marsh. Eggers Marsh is a 40 acre emergent marsh, what would have been historically described as an enlarged swale, located in Southeast Chicago, where 112th Street meets Hammond, Indiana. The marsh was once connected to the larger Wolf Lake wetland complex and lies immediately north of the lake. In the days of the Cold War, the land between Eggers Marsh and Wolf Lake was filled with industrial slag and other fill to create a Nike missile site as part of the Chicago defense system. An important consequence of that fill is that Eggers Marsh has been separated from Wolf Lake and water flow has changed from flowing south to instead flowing to the north. That alternate flow channel degraded over time, leaving Eggers Marsh impounded. It filled to its maximum height in the past decades and has not returned to its natural cycle of high and low water levels that made the marsh such good habitat for birds, turtles, and other wetland dependent groups. To restore the marsh, a way to manage water levels had to be devised. With the help of a grant from the Illinois DNR Coastal Management Program, engineers designed a system to restore the flow channel and add in features to better control water levels. That design was then used to repair and improve the old system with funding from a GLRI grant awarded to our Calumet Compact Group. Construction of that system was completed in 2019. With the water control structure in place, we can now better manage water levels to restore the natural vegetation in the marsh, improve habitat, and provide natural water storage during storms. We began drawing water down last fall in the hopes of invigorating the seed bank and initiating recovery of the marsh. Our bigger goals are to recreate proper habitat structure and attract once common species back to the marsh. More to come as that marsh recovery develops. Powderhorn Marsh, also located in Southeast Chicago along the Indiana State Line, is a 50-acre natural marsh that is attached to the 50-acre man-made Powderhorn Lake, located in the village of Burnham, with half the preserve in the city of Chicago and one half in the village of Burnham. This marsh has the same problems found in Eggers Marsh. Once connected to Wolf Lake, it is currently impounded by a railroad line, roads, and filled wetlands. The marsh has been nearly 100% open water for the last two decades, which is detrimental to marsh birds, fish spawning, and amphibians, as well as its once rich wetland plant communities. Again, with the help of the Illinois DNR's Coastal Management Program, a draft plan was designed to reconnect the marsh with Wolf Lake. A generous grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, the Great Lakes Commission, and Audubon Great Lakes, has funded the completion of the design that will reconnect Powderhorn Marsh and Wolf Lake through a series of short pipes, culverts, and open ditches. This reconnection will allow fish and other aquatic animals to move between the lakes. It will also allow for lowered water levels in the marsh, again, stimulating native plant growth, creating habitat for fishes, marsh birds, reptiles, and amphibians, 
as well as creating more water storage during storms. It is worth noting that a second focus for the forest preserves has been gaining control of invasive plants and restoring native vegetation to our properties. This has been done in large part through our Calumet Compact Partnership, successfully landing grants to fund cohesive work across the Calumet region. We have removed invasives in 11 forest preserves across 1,000 acres. Some properties that have returned to ecological health include Calumet City Prairie and Marsh, Burnham Prairie, Sandridge Nature Preserve, Wentworth Woods, Powderhorn Prairie, Eggers Woods, and Thornton Lansing Road Nature Preserve. More work is underway now at Brownell and Sweet Woods Preserves, Sandridge Nature Center, and Green Lake Savannah. Our goal is to push invasives out of all of our key Calumet properties by the year 2030. We are beginning to see projects meld together to create larger landscapes of habitat. We are also able to rely on our conservation partners in the Calumet to build a bigger system together. While we may never rebuild the pre-settlement natural wonders of the region, we are on a clear pathway to maximize nature in the Calumet region. None of this work would be possible without our partners and funders. Thank you for listening. Wow, and thank you, Chip. Um, that's just another great example of how important partnerships are to doing such great restoration work. I'm sorry, Craig, are you, are you there, Craig? Are you next? So let me, let me formally introduce Craig. <laughs> our next speakers are Jennifer Johnson, of the Audubon's Wild Indigo Program and Craig Zanstra of the Lake County Indiana Parks Department. And they're gonna talk about vision, action, and engagement along the West Branch of the Little Calumet River in Northwest Indiana. But before I throw it to you, I just wanna remind our viewers to please put your questions and comments in the comments section so we can address those at the end of the program. So with that, I'm handing it off to Craig and Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig Zanstra. I work with um, Superintendent of Planning and Natural Resources with Lake County Parks and Recreation Department. Um, Lake County Parks uh, um, has been, uh, began in 1968. Um, we manage about 8,000 acres. Um, between Lake Michigan and the Kankakee River. Um, uh, this uh, partnership that we're involved with, uh, the West Branch uh, Project, uh, we became partners in this uh, several years ago at its, at its inception and look forward to the coming years. Um, we're happy to work with the partners. Uh, we've had long-term uh, plans, Lake County Parks has, to, to help do management in the Little Kamet River Corridor uh, and to provide recreation and open space and habitat for uh, the citizens of Lake County to enjoy. Uh, if we can move forward on our, there we go. Uh, you can see here some of the partners that we have um, in our partnership. Um, uh, moving forward. Uh, here's our open space uh, vision plan for Lake County Parks. Uh, you can see in the North Lake Michigan, the South uh, Kinky River. Uh, along the top, we have uh, number three and four, Lake Etta County Park uh, is up along the Borman Expressway, 8094. Uh, number five is our Three Rivers County Park. Um, and that's actually up near I-65 and 94, the intersection. Uh, so it helps gives you an overall view of where these sites are located along with the Little Calumet River corridor um, in the Northern part of the county. Our goal here uh, for our group, um, Lake County Parks has hired a, um, a crew to do work along the Little Calumet River um, using grant funds and then also uh, partner funds to get the projects done. Uh, we're specifically um, working on sites, the Highland Rookery site by Klein Avenue um, in Highland. Uh, also, we're working at uh, MLK site uh, south, um, which is uh, uh, on Martin Luther King Jr. Drive uh, in Gary, uh, just south of the Borman Expressway. Uh, those have been the main sites that we've, our crew has been concentrating their efforts in. Um, 
Uh, also, they've been doing some work at our Lake Etta County Park as well. Um, here's another map showing um, some of the sites again. Um, uh, a little better map, uh, the Highland Rookery again to the west. Uh, Lake Etta County Park here is shown, um, which is the base of operations for our crew. And then also uh, uh, between there, you've got the Grant Street property, which is another site uh, is shown with the um, information on the map uh, where you're doing bird monitoring. Um, also, uh, then further east, we've got our Martin Luther King site uh, south, um, and then also the north site, and then also our Marshalltown Marsh. Uh, and then just to the east of that is our Three Rivers County Park site. Uh, here's some information as far as some of the work that's being done. Uh, right now, as far as the groundwork goes, um, our crew has been concentrating on invasive plant control. Uh, they started work uh, last June uh, on the sites mentioned before. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, spraying, of course, with herbicide. Uh, some sites that we've been working on have taken uh, a little um, extra care because there are some um, native plants that are in the seed bank and, and are uh, in the marsh area. So we've been trying to work around some of the, the native plants and then still trying to control some of the invasive species. Uh, this winter, we've been working on a variety of projects uh, with um, uh, woody removal in several of those units. So. Uh, we've been doing work with chainsaws, brush cutters, that type of thing, uh, and that will help us uh, come spring with some of the brush removal, and uh, we should get a good response of herbaceous plants after the brush removal. Next slide. Okay, uh, here's a, a small map of our Lake Atta County Park site. Uh, just a blow up of it, you can see the Borman Expressway to the north. Uh, you can't miss this uh, location to turn off now. There's a new Hard Rock Casino being built at uh, First Street and the Borman Expressway. Uh, this park site is just southeast of that. Um, we've got uh, frontage along the Lily Kemet River with a, uh, for access for boaters and canoers and then also for fishermen. Uh, there's a trail that runs along the Lily Kemet River levee for people to use. Uh, and then our crew that does the work along in the marsh areas, uh, they're based here at Lake Etta County Park at the maintenance barn. Uh, we've also got a banquet hall, a pavilion, picnic shelters, and some natural areas on site that we've been managing. So uh, there's a little bit of everything at this site, uh, you know, on the playground and so forth. Uh, we do have some acquisitions we're working on between uh, 29th Avenue and the Borman Expressway. Uh, we're picking lots up in there. There's a lot of wetland and remnant savanna, so we're working on that as well. Uh, moving along, uh, I just wanted to go into some aerial photos and also photos of the uh, uh, starting at the um, Highland Rookery site. You can see here we've got the outline of the um, uh, work that was done by contractors this last year, uh, the path that they did controlling some of the Phragmites and other uh, invasives in the marsh units. Uh, from there, we'll move into some other photos that uh, just stretch from uh, west to east along this uh, um, Highland Rookery site, you can see there used to be a lot of cottonwood in the site years ago, and because of high water levels, a lot of those have since died. And the rookery is the Highland Rookery site because at one point there was a uh, Great Blue Heron Rookery here, um, and uh, there was, I believe, one time about 100 nests in this unit. Uh, since then, because the trees are gone, they've moved to uh, uh, an area just south of Purdue Calumet, uh, right on the Borman Expressway. So if we want to just move the slides, uh, continue and move them further. To the west, you can see some of the work that's been done along the bike trail. Uh, this bike trail does see a lot of use from Highland residents and then also residents in Hammond and Munster. Um, and they uh, go back and forth all the way to Klein Avenue. Uh, right now, there's a gap at Klein Avenue, so you can't bike past Klein Avenue uh, by the railroad tracks. But eventually, that connection will be made. And then people will be able to bike all the way into Gary and then hopefully all the way to Three Rivers County Park. Um, continuing to the west with the photos, uh, you'll see the areas here that were treated. Uh, one of the large, uh, one of the large open water honey marshes that's in the middle of the rookery site. Uh, it's a good place to see a lot of uh, uh, marsh birds. And then continuing uh, on to the west um, or to the east, you can see uh, some more of the area that's been treated along Klein Avenue. 
Um, and then continuing on, um, we are looking back now towards the west uh, and then seeing some of the areas that were uh, controlled this last uh, growing season. Uh, here we're moving into the uh, uh, Martin Luther King um, uh, South site. And uh, you can see here is the uh, west side entry off, uh, ML, off, uh, off the access from the west. And then we'll just move further to the east with the photos here. And basically just showing some of the areas that have been, again, uh, done with contractor work and then also our crew work. Uh, this photo, because it's later in the year, uh, doesn't show a lot of uh, herbaceous stuff underneath. But this corner here, especially in the southeast corner of this unit, um, has some nice sedges and some other uh, herbaceous or forbs in it also. And so we've been trying to have a little lighter touch in this area to try and uh, preserve some of the uh, understory that's uh, native and then uh, work out some of the uh, phragmites and other invasives that are above and around them. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, but our crew has been doing a pretty good job of it. Now here's another shot of some of the marsh uh, closer to the Borman Expressway looking back south. Uh, and this would be over some of the areas that were treated this last uh, growing season. Uh, here's another shot again looking uh, further to the uh, west from the east. Uh, uh, this area actually was under water the previous couple of years and this last year with the drought we had uh, really dried out the marsh and uh, allowed for a lot of growth to come back in. So uh, when it floods uh, again here after the next uh, large rain we'll probably see a, another response here in the unit and uh, maybe good for some of the birds and uh, other wildlife that need some of that vegetation. Uh, here would be our um, Three Rivers County Park. Uh, Three Rivers County Park is about 150 acre park um, in the city of Gary and Lake Station. Uh, the yellow part in the middle, uh, we're right uh, just on the uh, um, east side of I-65, south of the uh, Borman Expressway, and also there's some lots north of the Borman Expressway that we've been acquiring. Uh, this site's really neat, and just in the last um, uh, six months, uh, the county parks and also Little Kemet River Basin Development Commission teamed up and purchased a 70-acre track from the city of Gary, uh, the former Gary Schools property. Um, this property uh, is going to help make this site a really neat park in the coming years. Also. Uh, provide for future access from uh, subdivisions or neighborhoods in Lake Station and then also allow us to connect uh, neighborhoods in Gary, specifically the Marshalltown neighborhood and our Marshalltown Marsh project. Uh, so Three Rivers will be a natural uh, uh, connection between the two. Uh, right now we have several projects going on in the park that's really neat and uh, will allow for more public access in the future. Um, uh, the site itself, um, we're, we'll, moving forward here, we've got some photos. We can just take a look at a couple of the projects that are going on. Um, here we go. Um, we're working with the Local Commission, and uh, there was an old dam that was built uh, um, about 1920, I believe, on Deep River. Uh, this dam uh, obviously was beyond its uh, lifespan. It was a sheet pile dam. And uh, it was a problem uh, for potential, um, uh, you know, failing someday. So it was replaced recently. It's in the process of being replaced. And uh, we've got a company working uh, with some consultants, a little Cal Commission, and they're actually rebuilding the dam. And we're doing it in a way where uh, there's a series of riffles and also um, stages that are being built along this stretch to replace the sheet pile dam. Uh, this is actually looking. Uh, um, north towards uh, the expressway, and you can kind of see the coffer dam there in the distance. Uh, there's actually a diversion channel right now, rerouting Deep River around the dam area. Uh, this new dam will allow for fish, amphibian reptiles to pass through. Also, will allow for paddlers and canoers, and also people enjoying the river. They will be able to uh, pass by also with this new design. Uh, the next couple pictures we have here, just moving. Um, kind of in the new dam area, looking more now to the south. Uh, you can kind of see um, some of the work being done. You can see the uh, uh, the coffer dam um, uh, further up there, and you can see Deep River uh, above the top of the picture. Um, that's where the diversion channel starts, and the river is being diverted around it. This is the company rebuilding um, with different boulders. Uh, also, they're putting fishing access in. 
um, and other amenities so the public can enjoy it and then also access the park. Um, we've got one more photo next that shows uh, kind of the same shot, but a little further along in the process. Um, you can see here the concrete's been poured and, and also the, uh, the notches are in the areas to allow for the water to pass and then also for the, uh, for the amphibian fish reptile passage and then also for the canoe kayak access through there. Also, you can see the bridge sitting there to the left, and the bridge will be across the river, and that will allow the access between uh, Lake Station and Gary, and then also allow access into the park from the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the last photo we have here um, is, uh, uh, this is uh, going to be a boat launch that's being put in. You can see here, looking back towards the Borman Expressway, in the distance, you can see the dam being rebuilt. Uh, this will be where we'll have a new boat launch and public access. Um, uh, in the, along Liverpool Road. And uh, with that, uh, that uh, ends my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Craig. And thank you, Jen, in the background. I know you're back there navigating the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so thanks to all that you all do. Oh, um, uh, uh, Commissioner yeah. Dubuclay, Jen, uh, Jen's presentation will oh, continue okay. here. Yeah, sorry about oh, that. <laughs> Hi, Jen, please continue. <laughs> You're on. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name's Jennifer Johnson, and I'm a Wild Indigo Associate, and I work at Audubon Great Lakes. Um, I am from Chicago, but I support and manage uh, Wild Indigo programs in Chicago and Lake County in Illinois, and I uh, coordinate nature programs in Gary, Indiana. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, my work and a little bit more about Wild Indigo. Uh, Wild Indigo is a, a community engagement program that was established in 2013 at Audubon Great Lakes. And it's a family program that seeks to uh, connect underserved communities with their natural local spaces. So that includes Black, Indigenous, people of color, people with disabilities, and the elderly. And currently the per program is in four states, uh, Illinois, Northwest Indiana, where I, where I work uh, primarily, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But throughout this presentation, I'm gonna focus more on Gary, Indiana, and some of the partnerships we've been able to build uh, while we've been there. On the next slide, just a little bit about Gary, Indiana. Uh, previously, it was part of the heavy steel mill industry. But over the years, the industry declined. And with the industry decline, it exacerbated uh, environmental problems like flooding, fly dumping, and it made a lot of the, their nature spaces inaccessible. On the next slide. We at Audubon Great Lakes and our partners recognized that these were large problems that couldn't be tackled um, by one organization alone. So that brought into play the Little Calumet Project, which was made to um, restore wetlands along the levee system in Northwest Indiana. Many of our partners have already spoken today but it also includes uh, Lake County Parks, the Wetlands Initiative, the Nature Conservancy, and the U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been essential to helping us plan and build um, better ways to restore the wetland. But even with all these great organizations together, we still needed the support of the people and local governments. One important uh, relationship we has, have is with the City of Gary's Environmental Department. The U.S. National Park Service has been uh, great um, providing space to have programs. Um, this was pre-pandemic and also a budding relationship with the National Federation of Block Clubs. They're an organization that's dedicated to neighborhood beautification and the Marshalltown Block Club uh, specifically as our project runs through the neighborhood of Marshalltown. I wanna talk a little bit about this event on the 
right here. This was from a biking and birding event. Um, this was a little bit before the pandemic. And biking was great to exercise our bodies. And we would bird together as a way to enjoy the environment and enjoy um, the peace and calm that can come with birding. But we noticed something as we were on our journey along the Gary Green Link uh, and going along the, the Grand Calumet River. We didn't see very many birds or very much wildlife. And it was a reminder of those environmental issues uh, that needed to be addressed. And so we recognized from that program and other programs yeah, that's the right slide. Um, that it was for a healthy landscape, you needed a uh, healthy biodiversity. And with the Little Calumet Project and with coming stewardship days and other modes of engagement, we hope that it can, that uh, Gary and more of Northwest Indiana can be a healthy heaven for wetland birds. And of course, provide a healthy, safe space for people. And on the next slide, healthy relationships are the key to tackling large environmental problems. And with visible improvements, they uplift up to the landscape. It uplifts, it up, uplifts the people and it gives them hope. And it also gives them um, it also gives them inspiration for the next uh, conservation leaders. There we go. So thank you so much. And I certainly appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Jan and Craig. And I apologize, I, I uh, missed that you had your own separate presentation. But thank you for all your hard work. Um, and let me just remind the audience once again to please put any questions or comments you have in the comment section so that we can um, answer your questions towards the end of the program. And uh, our next presenter um, will be Matt Mulligan of the Nature Conservancy. He's going to describe two brand new restoration projects. One is called Getting to Go at Square Marsh and the second would be Dead Stick Pond, which is something I mentioned earlier. So with that, Matt, please take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Mulligan and I am the Urban Biodiversity Program Manager with the Nature Conservancy. Today I'm going to talk with you about two potential future restoration projects in the Calumet region, Square Marsh and Dead Stick Pond. Both sites are located just off of Lake Calumet on the far south side of Cook County, indicated in the orange box below. This region has a history of industrial use, which previously led to the dumping of slag on the landscape. Slag is the remaining byproduct of the metal ore process seen in the image above, leading to essentially a really hard landscape that few plant species can grow on. Both Square Marsh and Dead Stick Pond have a history of metal byproducts being dumped on the site. We will first look at Square Marsh, which is owned and maintained by the Illinois International Port District and located west of Big Marsh and surrounded by the Harborside Golf Course on the north and west side, Stony Island Road on the east, and a narrow berm along the south separating it from Lake Calumet. It is a 140 acre site in size and has a history of industrial dumping as previously described. There are many challenges at the site, including extensive underwater debris as shown by the concrete in the bottom right image, as well as metal poles sticking out in the top left image. There's common reed that dominates the vegetation community as seen in the top left. There's slag, which is that industrial byproduct along the northern shoreline. Gary Sullivan and Wetlands Initiative performed the initial surveys to look at the bathymetry or water depth at the site, as well as the restoration potential of the site by identifying some of those challenges we previously mentioned. The bathymetry survey showed that an almost homogeneous depth at the site of about five to six feet deep um, all throughout this area. 
with only about 12 to 15 acres that were at a depth of about two and a half feet or less, which is the optimal depth for a hemi marsh uh, vegetation community, which we would hope to see at this site. There's a possibility to add a water control structure to lower the water level to its optimal depth. However, that would require Lake County Met to lower itself from the record high levels that it's currently seen uh, this past summer. Also in 2019, we had the Illinois Department of Natural Resources use electroshocking methods to sample the fish community at Square Marsh. This is done by sending an electric current through the water using two nodes at the front of the boat to temporarily stun fish nearby, which allows them to float to the surface, are sampled by the researchers, and then safely released soon after. These surveys found a relatively diverse community of 16 different fish species, including largemouth bass, white perch, but also found invasive common carp abundant at this site. This shows that square marsh can support multiple fish species in its current state. In December of 2020, the Nature Conservancy enlisted the services of V3, an environmental consulting firm, to determine the extent of underwater debris, as well as sample for potential elements in the water and soil that could have ecological impacts. This work was done using aerial drones and underwater sonar, which you can see in the images above, to inform us and help us to determine the feasibility of restoration work at Square Marsh. This information will guide our future decisions at this site. Another nearby site, Dead Stick Pond, is a 28-acre marsh and shallow open water wetland located just south of Square Marsh and north of the Calumet River. Despite the close proximity to the Ford Motor Company parking lot, there's a restoration potential to provide suitable habitat for threatened and endangered breeding marsh birds which live all throughout the Calumet and desperately need habitat. Again, Gary Sullivan and the Wetlands Initiative team assessed the restoration potential at Denstick Pond and found that up to 24 acres of high quality marsh could be restored, including potentially 13.3 acres of rare hemi marsh habitat, which if you're defining hemi marsh, it's really a deep marsh mosaic of open water and emergent vegetation that ranges from about one to three feet in water depth. So similar to what we're seeing, we're hoping to see at, at Square Marsh. And restoring this habitat could increase native marsh species diversity while managing wetland invasive species, such as non-native shrubs or common reed. And based on the initial information and in partnership with the organizations listed below, there is a plan to restore the site while improving public access using a trail system. This plan is separated into phases with the first phase focusing on improving water level control to restore wetland vegetation. So essentially installing a water control structure that allows for that water depth to be at that optimal level to have a lot of hemi marsh habitat. There's also the clearing of the drainage channel to improve water flow. So when the water levels get too high, it can drain into the Calumet River, removing invasive species, and then monitoring the success of all this restoration work by looking at the marsh birds that are at that site, as well as the vegetation community. Phase two will scope the feasibility of a bike trail that connects Stony Island Avenue, which is the dark blue line in the figure to the right, and Torrance Avenue, the white line, along the Calumet River. The project team listed below will also finalize restoration plans to convert all of the dead stick pond back to native vegetation and ensure a smooth water management and maintenance transition to the Chicago Park District. You can see the close proximity to Big Marsh, which is home to an active cyclist community. Increasing connectivity will allow for more community members the opportunity to explore the natural world while exercising outdoors. As Chip noted earlier, a lot of the restoration work in the Calumet region is done through cooperative partnership of the Calumet Conservation Compact, which includes the forest preserves of Cook County, Chicago Park District, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, the Nature Preserves Commission, Audubon Great Lakes, the Illinois International Port District, and the Nature Conservancy who coordinates these efforts. It's through this collaborative process that allows for multiple land managers to take on a more regional approach as opposed to a site-by-site -site strategy, which can have greater impacts on plant and wildlife communities as a whole. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have during the question and answering session later on.
Thank you. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, the, as always, your presentation was very um, helpful and I look forward to seeing more of the good work that the Nature Conservancy continues to do. Um, with that, we, I think, are at our very last, but, but uh, what, do we, what do we say? We say the best for last presentation. Um, and we'll hear about the poster children for a lot of this work. That happens to be those secretive marsh birds. Refugio Mariscal of Audubon Great Lakes will show us some exciting and brand new monitoring data from across the entire region, including the sites you've just heard about, as well as many others. And once he concludes, we will go right into our Q&A session. Rahefio, I'm sorry, I'm, I have so mispronounced your name. People mispronounce my name all the time, so I truly apologize. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation. My name is Rubio Mariscal, and I am the Conservation Data Coordinator for Audubon Great Lakes. I'm really excited to show you all this brand new conservation tool we've been developing over the past year, which is the Marsh Bird Data Hub. We launched it uh, just this week, so you all are getting some of the very first looks at the site. So the purpose of our Marsh Bird Mining Program in Calumet, uh, which is now going on its seventh year, uh, was to inform land managers about how the restoration impacted marsh birds so we can all work together to improve habitat for a suite of declining species. Uh, the region is where uh, Audubon Great Lakes began our work in wildland conservation, but we have had, uh, we've used this work as a model to expand our work across the region. Our goal is to make tools like the Data Hub uh, to be applicable everywhere we work. So the need for the Data Hub came out of the development of our Marsh Bird Monitoring Program. Through our conversations with our partners, we learned that interactive tools are needed to help us make a better connection between bird populations and restorations. Uh, we created a Marsh Bird Data Hub to be used by land managers as a visualization tool to help guide conservation. Uh, monitoring results available on the hub will be updated annually. Uh, there are also components that we welcome the public to interact with uh, to better understand the importance of this work. Uh, this will give the public, including nature lovers, birders, environmental advocates, and anyone really who um, is just be interested in learning the opportunity to uh, discover why wetland conservation is important. So before we take a tour of the website, I'd like to announce that the Marsh Bird Data Hub is now live. And it can be accessed through the Audubon Great Lakes website, which is gl.audubon.org. Go to the Birds tab on the menu bar, then Marsh Bird Monitoring Hub, and that'll take you to the landing page uh, where you can open the data. And here it is. Everything you see on this main page is accessible to the general public. Uh, we see the menu bar up top, the links to different sections. This last section here, um, titled Resources for Land Managers and Monitors, will take you to a separate page that's restricted and houses data and tools developed only for land managers and monitors. And I'll go into more detail on that page and how to gain access to it a little bit later. So the first two tools we come across are ones that uh, serve more as an introduction to the Marsh Bird Monitoring Program. Oh, the first tool being a guide of the 18 species we monitor for. And the second being a dashboard that displays information on each site. So here we see a description of Big Marsh, along with a picture, and uh, readings from our, the water gauge installer that we do monitor. Now at the heart of this entire program really is our monitors. Uh, without them and their willingness to be ready at four in the morning uh, to collect this data, this hub really wouldn't be possible. And as you can see, it's a lot of work. Uh, the 48 monitors that we had today have spent uh, more than 1,500 hours monitoring 39 routes. And that's an incredible amount of work that we didn't want to go unmentioned. And we are looking for more volunteer monitors for a couple of sites. So if you're interested, feel free to complete our volunteer interest form by clicking this button here, or you can also email me directly. And now we'll make our way to the final section of the main page, which is the data visualizations and tools, which I think is really the most exciting part of this website. Uh, the first thing we see here is a link to the resources for land managers and monitors page. Uh, and again, this, is, this page is only available to those who have uh, granted access. Land managers and, monitor, and monitors can request access by filling out the form uh, with this link here. And under that is the Marsh Bird Occupancy Dashboard which displays the likelihood of each marsh bird species being present at each site. 
And I'm going to go over that dashboard in greater, greater detail later. So before we dive deeper into it, let's head over to the uh, land manager and monitor resources page. So the first thing we see here is a brief description on the intended use and what's available for land managers and monitors. Under the land manager section, we have the detections dashboard, which displays the detections of our primary focal species from our monitoring. And we'll look at that as well uh, in greater detail later, in just a few minutes. Next are some more resources such as annual March bird reports that can be downloaded. And finally, a data request form. We know that while the dashboards are useful, we understand that some of our partners might have more specific questions about their sites that aren't necessarily addressed within uh, the tools that we see here. So we created this form to allow land managers to request some of the data that we gathered uh, throughout this hub. And now the final section of this page has resources such as data sheets and manuals that monitors will find useful. So now that we've done an overview of pretty much the whole site, uh, let's look at a couple of these tools more closely. These are ones that I'm incredibly excited to show you all, and I think you'll find the most interesting and useful as well. First up is the occupancy dashboard. Now, this one can be found on the main page. This dashboard displays the likelihood of a marsh bird species being present at each site on a scale of zero to one. So zero meaning a species is not likely to be present, and one meaning that a species is very likely to be present. On the top here, we have selectors, which we can use to narrow down by region, site, year, and species. On the left, we have a brief description and an indicator showing the average occupancy based on our selections. The bottom is a graph representing occupancy by species and year, and on the right is a graph showing occupancy estimates at each site. The map in the middle displays the, displays the sites with darker green colors representing higher average occupancy estimates for all species in all years. So one thing that really stood out to me while I was looking through the data here and setting up this dashboard is that although the data for the past 25 years has told us that marsh bird populations have seen an incredible decline in the Great Lakes in places like the Kalamata region where we've built partnerships and our partners have done incredible work restoring wetland habitat, we're really starting to see some signs of stabilization and even recovery for some of our species of greater concern. We can see that here in this bottom graph. We're starting to see some generally positive trends uh, for some species like the common gallon eel uh, and Virginia rail. And I wanted to focus on one in particular, uh, the common gallon eel. So I'll use the selector up top to see data only for common gallon eel. You'll see the indicator in the graphs change. And maybe I want to focus on one particular re region. So I'll select uh, Lake Kelly Met. I'll zoom into the map as well. And it looks like Big Marsh has one of the higher occupancy levels. So I'll select that site. We see that uh, Kamigalini was doing relatively uh, pretty well here at, at Big Marsh. And we can even narrow down by year if we really wanted to as well. So this dashboard can give us a nice general overview of how different species are doing at each site. Uh, but what if we're looking for more specific information? That's where the detection dashboard can come in. This tool can be found under the land manager resources page. This dashboard displays detections of primary focal species by our monitors. Um, and as you can see, it has a similar layout to the previous dashboard. In the map, you'll see the detections displayed as a heat map. Uh, and as you can see, I've already selected and zoomed into Big Marsh also selected a few species. We can see the areas of the park that the marsh bird uh, seem to prefer. Are these highlighted in the, the brighter yellow. And I'll zoom in a little bit more. Uh, and now the heat map is replaced uh, by points that show the locations and species detections. When I selected Big Marsh, uh, it showed me detections for the entire park. I can also select uh, specific areas by using this tool in the upper left-hand corner. Maybe there was some invasive, invasive removal done uh, in this particular area here. Uh, so I can isolate that area by using that lasso tool. As you can see now, everything within that selection is now highlighted and shown on the graph here. And we can even narrow down this uh, by species. So I'll maybe just choose only common gallonia this time. And you can see only common gallonia show up here. Maybe I just want to see uh, the common gallon detections in 2020. 
So that's just really an example of how land managers can use these tools uh, to gather more precise information on their sites. I think this is probably the one that I'm personally most excited about. And that was a pretty quick overview of the hub. And I encourage everyone to visit the sites themselves and interact with the different tools. Now, before I wrap up, I'd like to thank our partner organizations that you see here on the screen, and also my colleagues, Stephanie Belke, Nicole Minadio, and Dr. Sarah Saunders, who all contributed to the creation of the Monarch Square Data Hub. And we encourage everyone to explore the Data Hub, which is now live. Uh, feel free to contact me at the email you see here on the screen uh, with any questions or comments regarding the Data Hub or our Monarch Square Monitoring Program. We anticipate adding more resources and tools as our monitoring continues and we learn more about the needs of our conservation community here in the Calumet region. Uh, so any feedback really is, is more than welcomed. Uh, we hope you get a lot of use from the Data Hub and that it helps re uh, develop into a tool that helps us uh, as we continue our partnerships and uh, work towards some ambitious wetland conservation goals. Thank you. We are just uh, running a little, um, a little behind. Um, so I think I'm was supposed to send it to Brad, but there has been a suggestion that we just go straight to Q&A in the breakout session. So Brad, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or not. Uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. We have until three fifteen here, right? Is that mm -hmm. that's how this session is set up? Um, why don't we? Uh, Take the Q&A session to three, uh, 315, and we can go ahead and post that session link um, so we'll take what um, we can in the now. chat. We'll take what we can now, and if we need to put some over to the chat, we'll do that. So okay. take it away, Brett. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner Duplay. No, thank you. Uh, all right. So uh, I have seen a few questions um, through the chat. Uh, one of them I wanted to touch on. Uh, I think this is a good question for either Gary Sullivan or uh, or Craig Zanstra, uh, and that's regarding the work going on in Lake County. Uh, can we all uh, um, can you share with the group uh, the nature of that project uh, uh, regarding the U.S. Army Corps work that's going on and, and what that means for the for the for the scale and scope of restoration along the Little Calumet River. Um, so if I could go ahead and add Gary or Craig to the to the panel. Um, sure. Um, yeah, as far as the size and scope of the project with the um, Army Corps, I think that's going to help make this project in the coming years. Um, uh, having the Army Corps involved, especially with the Little Kemet River, is uh, important because we've got uh, the flood control project that's part of uh, the main part of the project. And so... Uh, our habitat and everything else is coming about um, after flood control number one. So, uh, so having the core involved, helping us with the uh, water control structures, possibly some remeandering, I think is great. So, thank you. And, and Gary, uh, you're screen sharing. I don't know if you want to uh, add anything. No, I think I think Craig probably wrapped it up pretty good. Um, we have essentially two sites which we're actively going to be working on in the coming year where we're going to be installing water control structures to essentially restore more natural hydrology in these uh, at MLK South and at uh, Heron Rookery. So these are both areas that haven't really had any kind of natural hydrology in, well, in, in many, many years. We don't, we don't even know how far back that goes. But if we can restore natural patterns of hydrology uh, and marry that to the invasive management work and plant installation, we're going to be able to get a type of marsh developing and, and maybe having marsh developing there that would be great for supporting lots of marsh birds. Thank you. Uh, all right, so there was another question uh, early on in the chat. Uh, um, this is a joint, jointly Audubon presentation, so of course we were talking about birds, but there were some questions regarding Hemi Marsh and its relationship to um, to uh, amphibians and reptiles. Um, I, I think Gary or Lauren, uh, if you would want to take that presentation or, or take that question. Okay. Yeah. No. There's there's a lot of different uh, herps if we're if we're really looking at herps that uh, really rely on Hemi Marsh. You know, 
there's certainly lots of frogs. You can imagine any kind of frogs that live in these systems, they would want to uh, take advantage of a hemimarsh type system. But also there's a lot of snakes that feed in wetlands. There are all the turtles that you might find out there. They use these hemimarsh systems for uh, as both a place to go hunt for food and to get out of the water and bask and warm up in the sunshine. Uh, other mammals use it. I mean, we obviously talked about earlier about muskrats, but other mammals that wind up using marsh systems use these places and um, as, as, a, as a place to hunt and rest and get away from predators. So um, almost at all different levels of the animal community, the, the heavy marsh is going to provide a, 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 a bigger, more extensive type of habitat uh, where they not only, you know, it's good for them, but it's also good for the other species that they rely upon. Thank you. Uh, there, there's another interesting question that I've been racking my brain who to ask it to. I, I think uh, Matt Mulligan, um, this, this question's for you. Uh, are there private lands that are still in private hands? Uh, no uh, rhyme intended that can be placed into conservation practices within the Calumet. Um, so looking to fill in from, you know, the, the extensive amount of, of public um, restored land, you know, are there, are there uh, opportunities for, for private engagement in conservation work? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because, you know, we're always looking to expand and really try to incorporate more natural landscapes into the area, both for the health benefits that it provides to us but also all the benefits that it provides to the natural world. And, uh, you know, in my presentation, we had talked a little bit about, um, you know, Square Marsh, and that was owned by the Illinois International Port District, which, you know, obviously is, is a government entity. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks within the Calumet Conservation Compact, so some of the folks that we listed earlier, Cook County Forest Preserve, Chicago Park District, Audubon, uh, and, and many others, we are working with the Illinois International Port District and they actually joined our compact as a way of making a commitment to, you know, conservation, to, you know, setting aside and trying to work with some of their land in order to make it, uh, you know, much healthier for both wildlife and for, for humans as well. Uh, so, you know, we're always trying to have these conversations with different land holding entities because we think that there's a way to collaborate and work together in order to make this landscape, you know, much uh, safer and healthier for all of us. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a question that just got posted by Glenn. Um, I want to ask this to Lauren and expand it out to sort of more uh, um, uh, uh, invasive plant control or just plant control management strategies. Um, uh, Lauren, in your experience, have you tried cattail mowing regimens for management of aggressive cattail stands? Um, or of, have you, um, what are some of the innovative measures um, you've taken or um, your team are considering for wetland restoration within the Calumet? Okay, I will, uh, I'm not seeing her jump on. I will, um, I'll go ahead and give, and give an answer. Um, in, in the Calumet region, uh, uh, we have found that marsh birds uh, uh, benefit from cattail stands to a, to a point where we, uh, we're, we're still not in a point in this restoration where we can really be bothered by extensive cattail stands with, um, in wetlands in the Calumet region, um, taking care of Phragmites and other non-natives is is first and foremost the priority uh, and then we can at least lean on um, muskrats and, and some some other natural drivers to help mitigate some of the um, extensive cattail stands but we, we do find that marsh birds respond well to the the cattail and yes it may um, um, increase with um, with uh, some additional cutting of the cattail but uh, so far, that's that has not been a priority. Uh, uh, you know, we're focused on getting that cattail structure there instead of the Phragmites. All right, and and Katie, you're going to kick us to the session. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much to the conservation action planning partners. This was um, such a wonderful and comprehensive 
presentation. And thank you, Commissioner Dubuclay, for your great moderation and Brad for um, handling everything on the back end. I think this was really wonderful and it was great to hear from you all.